How healthy is Washington to be for the Apple Cup? Let's find out. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back into another edition of Lockdown Huskies. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. We write for Inside the Huskies with Fan Nation Sports Illustrated. You can check out all our written work over at si.com slash college slash Washington. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the day. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash lockdown college and use code lockdown college for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks is daily fantasy sports made easy. All right, Lars, we are just returning from Kalen DeBoer's press conference as we do every single Monday. And uh, there were there was a lot of injury updates today. And I feel like the best place to start is with running back Dylan Johnson, who fans were uh, kind of clamoring like, oh, why, why weren't there? Uh, why, why wasn't he running the ball more on Twitter? We actually got a, a little bit of insight into that today, did we not? Uh, as he said that we didn't really specify when either, but that Dylan Johnson apparently got stepped on at some point in the game and kind of injured his foot Didn't say foot or ankle, but said he's in a walking boot. And so that's going to be uh, something to monitor for Apple cup week where both DeVore and Ryan Grubb said that they're feeling optimistic about him this week. But do you, do you think, do you think that he's going to play in this game? I would be surprised if he didn't because the problem is then you're now looking at Will Nixon and Tyba Rogers as your two starting running backs. I'm not sure Dylan will play like a significant number of snaps. I, I could see him doing like 10 to 15, knowing you're going to want to keep him for the Pac-12 championship, but you don't want him to have an entire week off unless he truly needs it. And it doesn't – both Kayla DeBoer and Ryan Grubb said they're optimistic or very optimistic, and I would think – that means he'll at least play, but how much is, was, would be the question. I think I don't think he's, I don't think he's going to sit out because otherwise, as Grub mentioned, I mean, with that injury, it could swell up on the plane. It could also swell up for an entire week if he's held out of practice and doesn't play because almost being off it might hurt him just as much, if not more, than playing. I, that, that, that definitely makes sense. And I think that it's just, it's probably going to be a pain management swelling kind of thing. Cause you hope it's not a sprain or anything like that. Doesn't sound like it's anything worse than that, which is a really good sign moving forward. Um, because if, if you were without Dylan Johnson for a, an extended period of time, as we we've talked about a lot of the injuries on this team over, over the course of the season, that that would just really be super detrimental to this team. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, even though the offense hasn't got the run game going and Brian Grubb touched on it, I have the story on Inside the Huskies about that. And I'm I'm currently in the third quarter and he makes some good points. He's got that Seth Myers, you know, he makes some good points. He makes some good points. <laughs> like, again, Ryan Grubb, to be clear, said for the people that wanted him to run the ball more, he tried. The problem was, in his eyes, 18 of the 23 runs that Washington had were ineffective. Meaning, and to our conversation before the show, we basically said effective probably means four yards or more, right? Three yards. Right. We don't know his exact grading system. Just to clear that up, but that was just kind of from 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 the context that we were given. That was kind of our our assumption, right? And especially when you look at that the the amount of three yard or less carries, they had a bunch of a couple of three and two yards. So you would think, okay, well, three yards, three yards gets you to still what third and. That would still end up being third and like if you if you ran if you ran for three yards a carry you would be in third and or you'd be fourth and one at the end of at the end of your 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 three downs yeah. Whereas if you run four yards you get four eight third and two you get four so so you're ahead of the stick so I think that's and if we really want to get into the weeds we can say three and a half but the game doesn't count half yards so. Right. That, that that and he's absolutely right. They, they for a number of reasons, right? Part of it could be the inefficiency in the run blocking, especially in the interior on the offensive line. To your point before the show, Oregon State does have a really good defense. So that, you know, Matt, Michael Penix wasn't sacked, but they certainly disrupted the offense. And I think, you know, again, I've kind of said it throughout the season where you're not necessarily going to sack Penix. You just have to disrupt the offense. That that's really all you have. Almost like Braylon Trias, right? Where he doesn't blow you away with his sack numbers, but he's got the second most pressures in the conference behind Liatu Latu. So right. that kind of speaks for itself. And and speaking of the defense, just kind of switch switching gears here a little bit because Dylan Johnson is going to be a big, big portion of this game, but almost more importantly, is the health defensively. Uh Tuli Latuli Gasnoa 
did get a little dinged up in this game. The the staff said that he is probably okay. Chuck Morrell called it an old man injury, which I, I personally found very amusing. Uh, but then he also, uh, they said that linebacker Alfonso Tupatala, who was kind of a surprise inactive in the game on, on Saturday, uh, Kalen DeBoer said that they're optimistic about him returning to action this week. So that might've just been something that, that happened towards the end of the week in practice, because we did speak to him on Tuesday and it, they, um, just for a, a little in, insight for, for for the folks at home, if you are healthy, then you're, or excuse me, if you're not healthy, you are not available to the media then. So Tupatala was available to talk to so that man who was healthy, at least on Tuesday after the first padded practice of the week. And then, so we'll, we'll see about his status. He seems to be coming back. And then Washington was out, was also without three safeties in this game. Asa Turner, who we kind of know his status, he posted uh, on his Instagram story that he was having surgery on his hand. So that was a couple of weeks ago. We'll kind of see what his status is. He's definitely not going to play this week. Probably won't play next week. Uh, maybe in a bowl game, we'll kind of see what, what goes on there. Uh, Cameron Fabiculon, and there's uh, Lars, Lars has, has some thoughts on that one, so I'll leave it to him. And then Vince Dunley, who um, Kalen DeBoer said missed the game for personal reasons, and we'll kind of see about his status moving forward. It did seem like it was related to whatever happened earlier in the season, but we will not speculate on that. So Lars, do you think that there's just one standout of this group of, yeah, they need to get this guy back and that would really help the defense? Yeah. And no disrespect to Asa Turner, but I think that guy over the course of the season has been Cam Fabiculati, right? When he's been able to fill in for Asa Turner, the defense and certainly the secondary specifically hasn't looked as bad as it has without both of them out, right? Asa kind of has more of the veteran experience, knows the understanding and came into the season with a firm grasp of the, of the concepts that Chuck Murrow wanted to run. Without him, Cam Fabiculati, who ironically is his roommate, has kind of had to fill that void and has done a I think more than fair job when he's been I mean, healthy. He's been, yeah. The The problem is he's kind of missed a number of games, not as many as Asa has, I believe, but he's missed a number of games this season to where they've had to rotate Mikel SD. Vince Nunley has even gotten snaps when he's been able to play on Saturdays. Um, and so, but they've, it's really been kind of a, a revolving door. They even slid Mish Powell, who's the Husky cornerbacks uh, slot guy this season up to safety with Dom Hampton. So, it's kind of if you can pick one of the three to have back, probably Cam Fab because he understands has enough of a veteran presence. Vince Nunley might have the higher upside of the two, but I think because of his inability, just for a, for a couple of reasons, right before he was health, you know, with the injury that he had last season, this season, a mixture of injuries and some personal things that we won't go into, have kept him off the field more than he would like to. So I think Cam Fab probably is the one that you would have to pick out of those three. I, I I would definitely agree there where that's because he's, he's just been so effective this season in every aspect of the game where it did, when we saw him on the field against Utah, it did kind of look like he was rushed back from injury a little bit in the way that he was forced to just kind of make an impact in that game where Washington has been really thin in the secondary this season. There've been so many injuries on the defensive side of the ball and that's really tough to see. Uh, but I, I would, I would agree and definitely think that he is, he's probably the most uh, just the, the biggest impact out of that group. And that also speaks to the effectiveness of Carson Bruner because Carson Bruner just had a fantastic game. And Alfonso Tupatala is a really, really good piece of this linebacker core. But just having a guy like Carson Bruner in there who's been just equally as effective, if not more so, and like he was, isn't, wasn't that Oregon State game, then that's that, that's a little bit just, you know, easier to, to, to take that hit of missing him for, for a game or two. All right, Lars, we are going to be switching gears here because on the other side of this break here on Lockdown Huskies, we are going to be talking about everybody's favorite thing, which as you're listening to this on Tuesday, the college football rank playoff rankings will be coming out later today. Uh, it's it's time to just go into whatever the college football playoff committee is thinking. We're going to try to get inside their heads. It's not going to work very well, but we'll see what we can do there. But we're going to be talking about our friends over at LinkedIn, because these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. 
just like, you know, I, I think Texas a and I, I know we've talked about it before, but if Texas A&M like actually use LinkedIn jobs instead of just throwing a bag of money at somebody, maybe they, they'd find a quality candidate like Kalen DeBoer was for the Washington Huskies. And it's super easy to use LinkedIn jobs. All you have to do is add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience. So you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown college. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, and we're back. Lars, we 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 love making fun of the uh, of the CFP committee on this on on this here show. Um, I I I, I had a tweet that kind of took off the other day talking about uh, Boo Corrigan, the 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 chair of the the CFP committee, who just has had some really frustrating things to say this season. Uh, the AP recently moved Washington above Florida State from number five to number four. Do you think that the college football playoff committee is going to follow suit? Uh, well, worth, worth noting for context to the coaches kept them in the same place. Coaches kept the coaches poll. They were still at five, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I know the ironic part about that is, well, which coaches voted, right? Well, most nine out of 10 coaches just pawned it off on their chief of staff or somebody else in the building and say, Hey, yeah. fill this out for me and put my name on it. But to that point, I think as frustrating as it is, I, I, I kind of went back to where, okay, I could see them being up to fourth. They're not going to move, move up to third, right? The question is, can they move up from fifth to third after this coming weekend, right? Does Or does Florida State move into four or move into three and Washington moves up to four? And then you let the conference championship games sort out whether Washington should be three, four. Because if, if they win the next two, they're in. The question of are they three or are they four and a lot of that, I think, has kind of been proven by the committee. Well, if Washington is undefeated, the highest they could be is three. Even though we talked at this some point in the season where they should be the number one ranked team in the country, may or be, maybe not. But I think, again, for a variety of reasons, you both UW and the committee have found a reason to say, yeah, we'll just keep them out until we absolutely have to. Right, and we, we've gotten to that point where it's not – or you, you can't do that anymore with the, the unfortunate situation with Jordan Travis – uh, and even then, like it was really past that point with this, with this win, right. Where even if Jordan Travis stays healthy, I really do feel like what Washington has done, their body of work this season has been so much stronger than, than Florida States. And that, and I, the, the tweet that I had talked about how Boo Corrigan is going to get up there and say something like, well, you know, North Alabama, they're, they're a stronger team than people think people are going to. People are going to run them down, but hey, they're, 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 those three wins they had, they're all quality wins. I'm not even going to go, go down that road today. But I think that that's something where that's that's the feeling that we've gotten from the committee all season. Where one of the things that he said last week was, oh, Washington's making it more of a conversation. When you have the most ranked wins in the country or tied for the most ranked wins in the, the country, how are you making it a conversation? Because you're not winning by 40 every week. And yeah, I understand why that would be frustrating. Like I do, but it's, it's something where it, we're, we're so far past the point of, oh yeah, well look at, oh, Florida state's got, got a really tough schedule too. The ACC has not been good this year. It hasn't like straight up. And the PAC 12 has, let, let's, let's be serious here. It's been the be- best conference in college football this season. And there, there are SEC fans that we've seen saying, oh, well, Washington wouldn't hold a candle to this SEC team or that SEC team. I don't know if that's necessarily true at this point in time. If Washington is able to play a complete game, which they've shown they can do, this this Husky team truly can't hang with anybody, in my opinion. When was the last time Washington played a complete game? Uh, Michigan State? I, I was, I was going to say Cal. Because they but, scored yeah, but, all three but, aspects of the game. But you have – that fair point, but you have to remember what happened in the second half against Cal. You let Cal back it to Cal, – that game should have been 52-10, right? 52-17 sure. if we're being friendly. And the fact that it was, what, 52-32? Again, it, it's it's extra points. To go, 50, whatever. But the point <laughs> – not to dismiss you, but just whatever. You're the same – the principle applies. We're in the 50s and we're giving up 30s. But the point is that was a game where if Washington wins that at 59-10 – Different story. And I know it doesn't sound like much, but 
and as much as we belabor Ohio State, 37-3 is different than 37-20, 37-17, right? You're sure. only let like, – have to, now we can say, well, what about 15-7 to against Arizona State? Well, the problem is that should have been 51-7, to not 15-7. to Like that's – that's the problem. Right. So that that game in itself was a problem. I'm not I'm not disagreeing with you there. But outside of that, we've seen the body of work that this that, that this team has done, especially against the quality opponents. Because the what did we just talk about? Like Michigan State, Cal, if that was the last like, you know, complete complete game this team has played, Arizona is going to be a top 15 team in the college football playoff rankings. Then it's Oregon. Arizona Arizona State was the outlier. Stanford, a bit of an outlier. We saw the offense come back to form a little bit. The defense still had some problems. And then ranked USC, ranked Utah, ranked Oregon State. So it's it's not it's, it, the, the body of work in terms of who this team has had to play against should speak for itself and just say, oh, well, yeah. And I'm this isn't an excuse. I'm not saying, oh, well, you know, the, the defense is so much better because they even though they played these good teams. It's no, they're playing good teams and they're finding ways to win because we've, I, I've, I've seen it like, you know, when we're going through the YouTube comments, something you, you and I have talked about, I've seen comparisons to the last year's TCU team and the Florida state team that got, uh, that got run out of the building by Oregon in the Rose Bowl. But this, this team is not those teams though. That Florida state team wasn't necessarily playing the same level of competition that TCU team definitely was not playing the same level of competition. I, I, and, and also keep in mind that TCU team lost their conference championship game. This, this is not either of those teams. No, I agree. But the problem was given where this offense and this team was at the end of September, where we were talking about 2019 LSU, right? Or 21 LSU, right. whichever the, the Joe Burrow, 19. 19. nobody yeah. can stop us, which Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson and company and all that. Because Jalen, because of Jalen McMillan's inability to stay healthy in the middle part of the season, right? Even though Jalen Polk emerged, right? Had right. you had all, if you had, and again, nobody's going to go through this through a college football season unscathed from an injury perspective. And it's a testament to Washington that they've still won all their games in spite of significant injuries. However, when you look at Michigan, when you look at Ohio State, when you look at Georgia. Georgia has a number of players injured, and yet they're still winning at a high clip. So it's like if Washington doesn't have that caliber of defense and the offense appears to have fallen off, the perception is going to change to where this team was 2019 LSU. Now it's closer to, maybe not exactly, but 21 or 22 Texas uh, TCU, right? Or the or the Florida sure. State team where it's not necessarily all the way there, but there's it's almost like which which edge are you closer to? Are you close? Are you are you closer to twenty one Joe Burrow? Where on some nights you would say yes, but then there's no run game. McMillan sure. is still working back despite what the coaches say, and and, and all those things. So there's, there's, I can, there is a level to which I can understand it, right? It's 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 frustrating as a UW fan, no doubt, right? Because you see your team go eleven or zero, and you're like, hey, we've done everything, give us some respect. But it's also like, well you are kind of fortunate to be undefeated because your defense has bailed you out a couple of times and your offense has bailed you. You haven't won a complete game in a while. Right. And that's, and that's one of the things where the injuries do come into play, right? Where that's, that's something that that needs to be noted in the sense of not only Jalen McMillan, Cam Davis, Mateo Mele, you can go to the defense and there are a couple that you can point out there with Asa Turner, uh, Devon Banks would have been playing a lot at this point. And then yeah. just the, the list does go on of, defensive players just players on both sides of the ball really that have missed time due to injuries and that's not that's not an excuse either this is this is not excuse making saying washington deserves number one be the number one team in the country because they're 11 now no this isn't that this isn't this isn't at all what what the argument is is here just, i just want to make sure because we're, we're we're saying the same thing here but it's this team deserves to be in the same consideration with these other undefeated schools it's not like they're like a like a true notch below them because on a good night, and this team has, and again, one of the things that this team has shown, which we talked about, is this team rises to the occasion. When this team has to play those big games, they they find a way to, at the very, very least, be competitive throughout the game. Because Kalen DeBoer is still undefeated against Frank opponents in his time at Washington. Right, and so I think, and I think it's almost like it's, it's that respect that it's almost like you would think I'm like. 
to to our point here, if they if the same the same thing you said about Kirby Smart, right? If he was eight and no in you know he would be on the cover of sports, you know, Sports Illustrated, not Sports Illustrated, but um uh, Sports Center, you know, doing all these things. Where DeBoer has been getting that, right, with his multi two appearances on the Pat McAfee show and things like that. But it still doesn't, you know, it's like people are still every now and then coming out on, on Twitter or X or whatever and saying, hey, you know, take a look it's at Kalen DeBoer. Take, take a look at what Kalen DeBoer is doing. He's eight, you know, this is that. It's like, we know. Welcome it's, to the train. But like the train's still already in motion here. You're not, you're not, you're doing like, wow, look at this old rustic train that I found that nobody else has discovered yet. It's like, <laughs> nah, he, he's there. He's bed on the train there's still plenty of room on the train but and and because DeBoer is such a nice guy he's not going to be like no nah, you know you're either with us or against us you know it's like he's never right. going to be that guy right but man i would i would love to see DeBoer turn heel at some point just, for, just <laughs> that, for we know we know that's never going to happen it's a lot like the guy who and for anybody who follows either, either one of us on twitter the, there's somebody who um was talking about Leia Tulatu as edge one in this upcoming draft like earlier this this year and i said hey man join the party washington fans have been here for a while like this is this is our train and he and he had a lot of really snarky comments for me and i was just like all right but it's it's exactly like that with kaylin DeBoer. it's like oh this guy is really good at what he's doing yeah we we, we know I, I, I like that point a lot. All right, Lars, we're going to have some fun here as, as we close out this show, because on the other side of this break, we are going to go through our most or our, what, what individual performance has impressed us the most this season. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. I know, I know you've got some, some fun ideas. I've got a couple of fun ones too, but first we're going to give a shout out to our friends over at prize picks because, Hey, who doesn't love prize picks, man, especially with all, all the options uh, with basketball season being here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league, a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. For example, you can pick LeBron James plus Travis Kelsey at a 10 and a half combo of three pointers made plus receptions and prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in place. Even if you, one or more of your players gets injured for football and basketball games if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second that player is rebooted price picks is the only daily fantasy platform with an in injury insurance policy price picks is really simple to play and you can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds do you want to get on the action go to pricepicks.com slash lockdown college and use code lockdown college for a first deposit match up to $100 again go to pricepicks.com slash lockdown college and use code lockdown college for a first deposit match up to $100, prize picks is daily fantasy sports made easy. We are back, Lars. I, I, because the, I thought this would be really fun because we've, you, we've seen some fantastic individual performances as, as any, um, as, as any college football media member would say they've seen over, a significant amount of time covering the team and on the heels of Jabbar Muhammad winning Pac-12 defensive player of the week for just one of the most dominant performances I've ever really seen a cornerback have in a game, allowing a zero passer rating when, when he was targeted. It's just unbelievable. And like for me personally, as somebody who was born in 1997, because people get on me all the time for saying, Oh, like, Oh, you got to respect the Don James era. I was I was not around in the Don James era. I, I apologize to all our, our, our older older everydayers out there. I I do not I I do not recall a lot of that. I would pick something like you know John Ross against Cal in 2016 or Vita Vea in the 2017 Apple Cup where he was just like truly dominant. If I had to pick one all time performance, and I don't know if there, there's anything that quite reaches that level this season, but do you have one that stands out to you as like oh this is just one of the craziest games I've ever seen just a player have. On defense or on either side of the ball? Either side of the ball. I mean, part of me wants to take the cheap route and say Westover's three touchdowns because it's it's so rare. First of because first of all, it's it's not necessarily surprising that a receiver had a multi touchdown game, especially in this offense, right? I mean, Roma Dunze has had four of them this season alone, right? There's usually one player every game that has two, but for the fact that it was a tight end. Almost like it was almost like a welcome to the Big Ten moment, right? Where hey, next year when you go to the Big Ten, you might have to have a game where yeah, your receivers have yards, but they don't actually get you the scores, right? You might need to get a little creative in the red zone. And to my, to answer my own question from earlier on the earlier on the show, 
that was your last complete game. And part of it was because everybody on the off, you had the run game going, right? Dylan Johnson, Jeremy right. Bernard had the run game going. Penix was on fire, you know, just throwing to everybody. And the tight ends got involved. And the defense basically almost pitched the shutout, right? I mean, theoretically, you get outscored in the second half, but that you're, we're splitting hairs here, right? You know, like if that, if you get outscored seven to six in the second half, but you had a 35 burger in the first half, it doesn't really matter. Right. You know that, right. It was kind of a, a almost like a complimentary way. To, and the cool thing was about that is because West ever gave a senior speech or a senior talk the night before the game. And that kind of laid the foundation for, for, you know, you'd have to come out and, and just lay the lumber to Michigan state. And we really haven't seen that since, right? I mean, they've had good games, right? They've certainly had good performances, but there hasn't been a true, like, hey, this is who we are, right? We are going to beat the – and now, again, perfect opportunity, right? Michigan State had just fired Mel Tucker, all that stuff. So it was almost like a perfect storm. But this team doesn't need other teams having, you know, stuff going on for that to happen, right? I mean, it's not like – you know, look at Michigan, right? They're they're still winning despite all the stuff that's going on with that program. So it's not to say that, oh, hey, just because a team has some stuff going on means you're going to blow them out. I mean, if that were the case, Washington would be, what, eight and four this season? Seven and five? Probably, yeah. Somewhere in that range. I mean, according to Peter Burns, nobody else would be 11 and 0. And, you know, it, actually, no, according to Peter Burns, he, uh, Dylan Morris could do exactly what Michael Penix could, and Ty Thompson could do exactly what Bo Nix could do. So, yeah, yeah let's the more you know down that road, <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> but so I, I have one on both sides of the ball. So if you want to, because I'm still deciding between a few on on the offensive side. So if you want to, if you want to pick one on the offensive side, I'll start with my defensive one. I was deciding between two on defense, and one was Braylon Trice's 16 pressure performance. That was that was one of them. But I'm gonna go with the obvious one. I'm gonna go with Jabbar Muhammad. Yeah, we're we're coming fresh off that performance, but I just, I, I'm a, on defense. There are two things that just, when I, when I watch film, especially I, once people, people will learn a lot more about my, my just nerdiness as we get into NFL draft season here. There are two things that I just love watching on the defensive side of the ball. And that's good, good play from the interior of the defensive line. Just good sound, just pure dominance at times. Like watching Vita Vea literally whenever. That's why he's my favorite Husky ever. And that's that's a conversation for another day. I could do a whole show on that. But Jabbar Muhammad showed that same level of dominance from at corner, which is the, the second, the second most, uh, just my, my second favorite place to watch that kind of dominance. And not only did Jabbar allow that zero passer rating against, he had all three takeaways in that game. Carson Bruno deserved a lot of credit for forcing that fumble, but who was there to recover it? Jabbar Muhammad. Jabbar Muhammad on the, the first pick, he was the, the benefactor of a tip, but he was still in the right position to make a play. And then on the second one, he just made a fantastic play to make sure that he would, it was able to step in front of that pass from DJ Uyunglele and get that interception plus four PBUs in that game. He was just all over the field and, I, I feel like a lot of, or like just what makes it even more impressive is that the Huskies were so thin in the secondary and that somebody needed to step up and make that play. And he did that. And I, I think that that's why he, he deserves that, that honor, especially on the road in the pouring rain against the number 11 team in the college football playoff rankings. When you, when you said obvious choice, I, th I thought you were going somewhere. To, no disrespect to Jabbar. I mean, you, sure. no, I can't, can't dispute any of that, but the obvious one, if we're talking about defense, Zion two pull of a three against USC. I mean, like, like that's so of, that's that's my favorite. There's a I, so that was a like a great performance, and I would say my personal favorite to watch because of everything that was behind it. But I I, I don't know if it was necessarily dominant in the same way where it's just well in in, in, well, in the way that I was going for because that 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 takes the cake is the most impressive, most just fun moment to watch all season long. Well, I think the reason why he was so dominant, and again, we both love Jabbar, so this is not to slight Jabbar, but that second interception was a gift, right? The first one, great read, right? But the, the one that literally... No, that, you, you, got to, you got to flip. The, the first one was the tip. The right, one right, right. Tip. So first one was kind of a gift. Second one was an actual, okay, great read, but a lot of his other plays are great reads, right? But the first the first one was kind of benefit of the draw, right? Whereas Zion, not only does he get the sack, but he gets the sack fumble and the recovery and what that meant to be a top 20 a top 20 USC team granted who was already on the ropes but for when you combine and right to your point I'm not saying you forgot about it right but I mean I think to me it's right. almost like that one you know Jabbar could have had 
I mean, Jabbar would have needed like four picks, right, for me to put I get that, that one above Zion just because of everything. And I'm not saying that you're not showing the love to Zion, right? Because absolutely, right? Otherwise, it's right. like favorite play, just great moment for everything that it meant. But I think, you know, for everything that he's gone through in his career, right, where, you know, comes in, has that great year in 2020 where he's only got seven games, but he had four games, five games, but he has like seven, eight sacks. And like, hey, here, here's the next guy. And then it didn't materialize like he wanted to in 21, maybe right. due to some coaching struggles and things like that. Well, that, that was also the there. injury too. And and then he has the unfortunate injury. Well, actually he has the injury and then, you know, the coaching and, and all that yeah. and, just, and, and everything. And then you have to learn an entirely new staff, right? And then, you know, step behind Jeremiah Martin and Braylon Trice for a year. And then, you know, earn a spot this season and then, you know, all that. And then to lose his dad the way he did and, and everything. And then to, but then to come back the next week, right. You know, when, right. And, and, and not only just come back where it's like, Hey, you know, he had a couple of tackles, he played through it. You know, he actually had one of the more impactful plays in the game, right. That, that sets right. up Washington to win that game. Cause if Washington doesn't have that, if someone lose to USC, we're not even talking about Oregon state. Right. That's, we might, that, we might, we, we probably are, but certainly not in the same light as it, we have been. That's that that that's fair. I, I I like that point a lot. And now I so I'm still uh, I'm still kind of deciding because Dylan Johnson seems like one of the best choices on offense, uh, and and that that same game. But there's so many that I want to go with, and I think what I'm going to go with because I wanted I, we we love Michael Penix and he deserves a lot of credit, but I think that I'm going to go with Roma Dunze versus Cat, and I. I was gonna say I, I was I was expecting yeah. more of a reaction on that one. No, 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 no. I was like, yeah, it's almost like he cooked in every facet of the game. Almost Absolutely. like he didn't play defensive back. He probably could have, honestly, probably should have. So. <laughs> with the because he he opens the game with the punt return touchdown. Then he has that fantastic grab on uh, on the 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 out route from thirty five yards out, something like that. And he just that was one of the Roma Dunze. We on this show have talked about him as one of the top receivers in this draft all year. And we know that's not a hot take, just like we were, we were making fun of that in the last segment. We, we, we know that that's not a hot take, but that was kind of one of his real, I would say, arrival moments in terms of the national perspective this season. That's that's coming off his, of nine catches and 180 yards at Michigan State. And he played really, really well throughout the non-conference stretch. But that was the game where it's, oh, not only is he, is he a fantastic receiver, check out his athleticism in the open field returning a punt. And we just got to kind of see exactly what you and I have been talking about, exactly what we saw from him all of last season too. Just got, But it kind of felt like it was taken up a notch. It was kind of turned up to 11. And then we saw it again, especially against Oregon. We've seen it time and time and time again from Rome, but that one really felt like a, wow, look at him. Like, cause that was the, the first complete game without Jalen McMillan back there at punt returner also. And on his, his first touch as a punt returner. Yeah. I'm just going to, you know, take this to the house. Just, I, I, I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. Well, also, I mean, almost like which play was better, the punt return or the hip adjustment, hip adjustment, um, to go to Mike adjustment when, there. When, my, from the mic adjustment from Mike to Mike throwing him open, and it's like, you know, I remember because I remember asking Penix about that. Like, he's like, "No, I threw him open." And it's like, I know, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. We had this conversation with DeBoer last year about you throwing guys open, but then you go back and it's like, oh wow, that route actually was not a curl route. That was not designed as an original curl route, right? So to your point, yeah, that really put both of them on the map more so than they already were. Absolutely. Lars, as always, thank you for being here. Thank you to all the everydayers out there for tuning in. We do really, truly appreciate your support uh, through all this. It, it does mean a lot to us. Thank you so much. Uh, and if you're new to the channel, hey, welcome. Uh, we'd love for you to subscribe. Hope you, you enjoyed all the content you saw here today. Super easy to subscribe. Get involved with us. We're everywhere you get your podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music. We are there everywhere else. Please feel free to subscribe. And so you never miss an episode. Like the video. Leave us a five-star review if you're audio only. Drop a comment below if you got any questions, comments, concerns. We try to get back to you as many views as we possibly can. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we will talk to you on Wednesday.